followers of the Nerdland Twitter hashtag are by now familiar with another hashtag that I have felt the need to break out every now and then. FBJ. The last two letters are referring to the name of Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, and the first letter being the thing I wish I could do sometimes when it comes to the chief executive of my home state. Forget. Okay, if only it were so easy as just wishing him away, because lately, whether you live in Louisiana or are just watching Super Bowl coverage and therefore must keep looking at the television about Louisiana, there is Bobby Jindal, who has made himself and the possibility of his presidential run in 2016 impossible to forget. In a recent Washington Post editorial, Governor Jindal appealed to President Obama for a meeting to advise him on how to fix Medicaid, pleading for, quote, flexibility for the states to make their own decision about the program. Well, thanks to recently announced cuts in Louisiana's Medicaid programs, we know exactly what Bobby Jindal's idea of flexibility looks like. As of this week, if you are a poor person living in Louisiana with HIV, you will lose your case management visits. If you're a low-income first-time mother, you can say goodbye to at-home visits from a nurse to help you care for your newborn. And if you're a child in need of behavioral health services, prepare to lose them. If you're a nursing home resident who relies on physical or speech therapy, you can now cut off from that service, too. Thanks, Bobby Jindal. All of this in a state that already has some of the highest rates of poverty and lowest rates of insurance in the nation. Until he can get his own house in order, my advice to Governor Jindal on aspirations of the White House, FBJ. Forget it, Bobby Jindal. At the table, University of Connecticut's Jelani Cobb, Democratic strategist John Rowley. Former chief of staff to Newt Gingrich's 2012 presidential campaign, Patrick Millsaps, and Rajiv Malhotra, who is the writer and public speaker on current affairs and a leader, an active leader in Indian American affairs. I'm going to start with you, Rajiv, because you wrote quite a fiery piece um, in the Huffington Post about my governor, uh, in which you said that Indian Americans have been dismayed to see that he has done nothing for our community while soliciting us for campaign funds. He has morphed at an early age into exactly the kind of candidate the people of the, of his southern conservative state would elect. Well, you know, the Indian Americans are overwhelmingly supporting of President Obama. In fact, 84 percent of the Indian American vote went for President Obama. And so that tells you the ideology and the values and the mm -hmm. thinking of the Indian American is completely the opposite of Jindal. Hmm. So Jinder, representing the extreme right wing, yep. uh, has done two shifts. The first shift he did was when he entered politics, converted himself to an extreme, uh, you know, extreme version of mm -hmm. Christianity. Wrote to President uh, Bush that this conversion is going to drive his and guide his political career. Got some endorsements, mm -hmm. so became as white as he could, except for his skin color. His his but manners. You, you use the language of passing to describe. That him. is correct, because I think the uh, the American experience being one of immigrants and new people coming to the country is an experience of uh, groups forming their identity as Americans, different kinds of identities. So the Indian American group is a new one mm -hmm. and is still in the early stages of defining who we are. And so most of us are quite dismayed at the sellout and the hypocrisy of Jinder because he's, on the one hand, he's distanced himself from the Indian American community except when it comes to making, uh, mm -hmm. getting fund funds from them. Uh, and on the other hand, very recently, the Republican Party has an identity crisis, realizes that they need to yep. be less white. So suddenly he flips around and says, I'm the guy. Yeah, and, and, so, and, and Patrick, actually, I want to come to you on this because this, is, this does seem to be one of the lessons of 2012 for the Republican Party is, okay, we actually have a pretty deep bench of Republicans of cover, color. Yep. Nikki Haley is on it. Uh, Susanna Martinez is on it. And my governor, Bobby Jindal, is on it. So... It, it, when, when you hear, though, that there is an authenticity claim within his own community that is problematic, what does that mean for Republicans who are hoping that this bench of, of Republicans of color will help move them into the next arena? Well, well first, let's, let's, uh, let's do a positive. And, and, okay. and uh, having an elected official in Louisiana that's not under federal investigation is always a good thing. <laughs> well, yeah, so that's there, true. There's, a, there's a cup half we're, full. We're big on in, that. In Bobby Jindal's favor, he's sure. not being investigated for anything. Right now, so, but sometimes it takes a couple of years. <laughs> and then, uh, you, well, you never know. Um, and secondly, and, and the Republican Party actually does have more minorities in governor and governorships yep. than the Democratic Party does. Yep. Um, the, 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 my concern about what Bobby Jindal is doing, what, what we're doing is attaching his budget concerns 
Um, and these are budget concerns. I mean, when you list the things that he's talking about, it's, there's tough, I mean, when you're talking about people with HIV not getting treated, that's a hard thing. But that's, that's a financial issue, and, and to attach that as to, that makes him more white or less white, I don't know if that's a oh, fair assessment. Oh, sorry, I, that, that's just, fair, yeah. Can I jump in for one second? Sure. Okay, here's, here's one thing, right? Yeah. Louisiana has the second highest black population in the country, yeah. as you know. Like, if we were talking about a state in which these people who are poor, these people who are mm -hmm. going to disproportionately yeah. bear the brunt of these cuts, were not African Americans, this would be an entirely different conversation. 35%. Right, yeah. this is, uh, 36 yeah. is Mississippi, and then, and then Louisiana is like around 33 mm percent. -hmm. Well, I've, we've done a lot of work over the years in Louisiana, and so I've watched Bobby Jindal since almost back before he converted from being a Hindu. I mean, I, I fancy myself, sadly, for good or for ill, a Jindalologist, because I've watched him. <laughs> and, and as he tries to become a national figure, we're in an era of authenticity hmm. of politics, and hmm. he's going to have big problems. This is someone who not only changed his religion, he changed his name. He used to be, he was in the Bush uh, administration on health. He's changed some of his policies positions. He's even changed campaign tactics. The reason he didn't get elected governor and Kathleen Blanco did is he was the only Republican in America at the time who wouldn't attack someone and now he's evolved. And so mm -hmm. we, I, I'm not claiming every one of these things. He also, his third child, somehow he was mysteriously there and delivered his third child. And so I, I don't know that any or all of these things are inauthentic or lack authenticity, but when you add them all up together and then you watch him perform mm -hmm. and he's like the Republican Al Gore of in terms of being oh, ham handed or John Terry or something. <laughs> right. Wait, I, I want to bring in real quickly State Senator Karen Carter Peterson of Louisiana. She's actually chairwoman of the Louisiana Democratic Party, and I want to bring her in, uh, Karen, on this question. Patrick said, "Okay, look, you, you know," and I think this is fair because we do have difficulties around this. I think with with, with black representatives as well. Like, you don't want to attach some sort of racial or ethnic authenticity on the one hand with policy positions on the other. But but the fact is that he's made making choices that are that are over and over again just born by poor people and those poor people are overwhelmingly people of color in our state. Yeah, I mean, look, Melissa, let's just let's just do a fact check and I, the, over the last 5 years, Governor Jindal has cut Medicaid every year. Uh, Louisiana has one of the lowest el eligibility levels in the country. 12% uh, of the poverty level for those people that are over the age of 19, not disabled and not pregnant uh, with respect to eligibility for Medicaid. That's ridiculous. Um, his political ideology and his political ambition has been paramount in any decision that he's made. Um, it's been to the detriment of our citizens. And, and look, part of this for me, again, is not to say, oh, is he authentic or not, but rather that there's a political point to the authenticity, right? That the, that the issue is that for Republicans, you know, to, when you're going to put Bobby Jindal forward, it's with the sense that there would be a more compassionate conservatism, yes. Yes. and yet we see no compassion in, for example, how he's crafting health care reform. He's a, he's a Rick Perry in a different skin. And this skin he's uncomfortable with. Hmm. He, he's uncomfortable being an Indian American. He's rejected that or distanced himself. He's rejected his religion, distanced himself from his ethnicity and the, and the groups, except when it comes to fundraising. And now that the Republican Party needs somebody who represents diversity or who they can hoist as a diverse person, he stands up and wants to be the yeah, candidate. Yeah, it's interesting that you say Rick Perry, because Rick Perry, in certain ways, got Rick perry in this last primary because he was compassionate in two spaces, right? He had a position on uh, Gardasil that, that was a very common sense, reasonable position over which he was attacked, and he had an initially common sense position on immigration, right, and on the issue of dreamers, basically, in the public schools in, in Texas, both of which got him torpedoed. Well, can we, let, let me, we've got two topics, there's two okay. things I'd like to divide up, right. and, that, and number one is talking about poverty mm -hmm. and then talking about neighborhoods of color as if those are synonymous. I think that's, I do, well, I, I, I do you, not. You, you hang out, Louisiana, right, you know that they, they lay over I, I understand that, but to assume, it, statistically it's the case, but to assume that people of color are going to be in this other, is I can't stomach that. So let's talk about how you deal with 
um, poverty because we I live in one of the poorest congressional districts in America yeah. and and the other thing we need to separate out is is that we're is Bobby Jindal the potential presidential candidate mm -hmm. and Bobby Jindal governor okay okay yeah, so you. let's talk about Bobby Jindal governor and and we you keep saying that these are not compassionate moves mm -hmm. well Louisiana also has a balanced budget requirement and so if you cut from one to put somewhere else. So what other programs? Well, how about, how about raising revenue? So, so yeah. I hear you, right? So, so one possibility, and I'll, I'll come back to Karen on this, one possibility is about raising revenue. And what we know is that Louisiana has one of the most regressive tax plans mm -hmm. and, and that the governor is encouraging even a more regressive one because it lays on top of sales tax. And so we know sales tax means poor people go to buy consumer goods, go to buy groceries. They end up paying a much higher proportion of their budget, while at the same time we're cutting taxes for the, for the very wealthy. Karen, you're there in the state legislature. How much state legislature? How much of this is just about the economics of it, and how much of this is about the ideological choices to position Jindal the governor for Jindal the presidency? There's no question that this is to position him for uh, 2016, Melissa. Look, uh, let me give you a specific example. Just a couple of years ago, the governor was unwilling to raise the tobacco tax in Louisiana. All of the money, uh, while Republican governors all across the country, whether it was Charlie Crist or Haley Barber in Mississippi, they were all willing to increase the tobacco tax because it was tough times. Well, our governor said no. Not only would he not do it, he would said he would ve he vetoed it. And then the legislature had to pass a constitutional amendment just to renew four pennies on the tobacco tax. We're one of the lowest in the country, 36 cents. So now, as he rolls out a new plan to eliminate income taxes, eliminate corporate uh, taxes, um, but change, like you said, to sales taxes, he's also putting on the table right now, oh, well, guess what? I'm interested in increasing the tobacco tax. That right there is evidence mm -hmm. of the ideology and the flip-flopping, making... It Good. Yeah, absolutely interesting. We're, we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back. We're going to talk, continue to talk about Louisiana, but also broaden it out because part of what's going on here is the fact that the South is a one-party town. Mm -hmm. yeah.